Okay, committee members, we're good to go. Thank you. This committee of adjustment meeting of Tuesday, July the 13th, 2021 will come to order. Members of the public, staff, presenters, and members of the committee, please be advised that meetings be broadcast and recorded and made available on the internet. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof of any of these applications? Seeing none, um, we have uh, the first application is A2021. If you could please announce the purpose of the meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. If the Committee of Adjustments holding a public hearing in accordance with Section 45 of the Planning Act in order to consider five applications for relief from bylaw 2009-21 being the comprehensive zoning by bylaw for the township of Selwyn. The prescribed notices of the public meetings were provided by prepaid first class mail to all residents within a 60 meter radius of the subject properties. Ministries and agencies were circulated via email. The subject properties were posted with a sign advertising the public hearings. The notices were also available on the township's website. The notice of circulation complies with the requirements of the planning act. If a person or a public body does not make oral submission at the public hearing or make written submissions to the committee of adjustment of the township of Selwyn before the various variances granted, the person or public body may not be entitled to appeal the decision of the committee of adjustment to the <clears throat> to the local planning appeals, uh, appeals tribunal. If you wish to be notified of the decision of the committee of adjustment of the township of Selwyn on the proposed variances, you must make written requests to the secretary treasurer of the committee of adjustment uh, uh, to be considered. Uh, yes, as you noted, Madam Chair, the first application before the committee this evening is application A20-21. It was provided to us by Michael and Trish Crossman, and it relates to uh, 367 Gifford Drive in the Ennismore Ward. Uh, the application uh, is seeking uh, uh, three variances from the township's uh, zoning bylaw. Uh, the first one is to uh, increase the maximum lot coverage permitted for all structures from 20% to 23.6%. Uh, the second is to increase the maximum lot coverage of accessory structures from 5% to 7.05%. And uh, thirdly, it's uh, the, the application is seeking to reduce the setback from high watermark from 30 meters to 28.6 meters to a dwelling and to 15.2 meters to a septic system. Madam Chair, the application is, is, in, 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 is being requested in order to permit the construction of a 343 square foot term square meter 3,695 3, square foot dwelling with an attached 209 square meter, 2,250 2, square foot garage and several decks. Further, the applicants uh, are seeking relief from, uh, from the bylaw to permit the construction of a septic system within the high water mark as well. Uh, I've provided uh, the committee with a summary of uh, my thoughts on how the proposal uh, meets with the four tests that uh, the committee must consider. Uh, namely, uh, does the application, uh, is it, is it, um, does it meet the general intended purpose of the township official plan? Does it meet uh, the, the intended purpose of the township's zoning bylaw? Is the variance minor in nature and it is, is it an appropriate form of development? So I, I note in my report, Madam Chair, that the lot is made up of two former lots of record known as 367 and 363 uh, Gifford Drive. And both of those lots were historically developed with a dwelling and accessory structures. All of the structures were demolished and a new boathouse was constructed. Uh, and the lots are vacant, save and except for that boathouse. Again, I've outlined, I've out, I've outlined in my report uh, my, my thoughts as to why I believe uh, in this particular context that the uh, four tests are, are being met. Uh, in terms of correspondence, uh, as we noted, uh, we, we have received comments from uh, the Peterborough Public Health Unit who note that they have no objection. Uh, we've received uh, input from the Conservation Authority who also have no objection, but have asked for their, their typical uh, uh, conditions, being that they'll, they'll require a, a permit and secondly, that. Uh, 
don't want a planting plan. Uh, I've also noted, Madam Chair, that uh, my review of the application in light of the uh, Ministry of Citizenship, uh, Culture, and Tourism and Sport, uh, their checklist as relates to archaeological assessment. And uh, we have established that an assessment will be required in this particular context. Um, that is a summary of, of my report, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I understand, Deputy Clerk, that the owners, Michael and Trish Crossman, are on the line. Is there anything you wish to add to Rob's report? Mr. and Mrs. Crossman? Is there anything you wish to add? Oh. No, no, everything's good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Clerk, is there anyone else that had put their name in to support this application? There's no one else here to support the application. Thank you. And um, I understand there are questions from Ed Ward. Mr. Ward? You have to unmute yourself, sir. Yes, Madam Chairman, can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Councillors. My name is Ed Ward. I've lived at 364 Gifford Drive for 30 years this upcoming August. My property is not Lakeside, but is opposite the applicants. Thank you for letting me take this opportunity to relate to you concerns that I have about this application. Politely, tactfully, I bring to your attention the matter of the placement of the proposed septic tank installation. While I do not disagree with the size of the tank slash septic bed, as five washrooms do require that larger system, I have serious concerns about the distance the system will be from the high water mark. The applicant is requesting a variance of up to 15 meters and thus placing the tank slash tile bed as close as 50 feet from the shoreline. This request fails to satisfy the four tests of the Planning Act section 45 bracket one of the Ontario Land Planning Act. It does not, A, conform with the official plan, B, conform with present bylaws, C, ensure appropriate use of land, and D, be within the present character and intent of the neighborhood. It is on the onus of the applicant to be sure that all four tests of section four bracket one be met to achieve a sense of scale and be physically sustainable in the present environment. The proposed variance must have regard for the matters of provincial interest such as the protection of ecological systems, including natural areas, features and functions, and the orderly development of safe and healthy communities. Also, if this variance of 14.8 meters, approximately 50 feet, is granted, it will be quite precedent setting for future lakeside septic systems to be placed no further than 50 feet from shoreline. Many lakeside residents who previously did not have the allotted 30 meters from shoreline were forced to relocate their complete septic system to the roadside of their house, requiring additional landscaping and ultimately proving to be quite unappealing curbside. 
Aside from failing to meet the four tests of section 45, bracket one of the Planning Act, this upcoming decision about the placement of the septic tank tile bed almost 50 feet from shoreline is truly a watershed moment. No pun intended. This variance, if granted, could become the new bylaw for future installation of septic systems throughout the municipality. The proposed variance will not meet the provincial and municipal objectives with respect to the creation of a primary dwelling that is appropriately serviced by policy driven, especially section 45 bracket one of the Planning Act. Secondly, I am addressing the size of the proposed garage. That is approximately 2,200 square feet. Not that it can accommodate a number of vehicles on the top floor, but the potential use slash misuse of the lower level of this 2,200 square feet. At present, our area is zoned residential and I would not want it to be considered commercial as pertaining to the possible use of this lower level of this garage for the storage of, maintaining of, and or movement of equipment such as backhoes, front end loaders, and dump trucks that are now being used in the operation of the applicant's excavation business. My comments have no bearings slash restrictions as to the successful operation or operations of the applicant's business. But I am cognizant that this lower level of 2,200 square feet in the garage potentially could be used for the warehousing of the equipment. This does not comply with the four tests of section 45 bracket one of the Planning Act. It is not within the public's interest to grant this variance as it does not represent good planning. In conclusion, the proposed variances do not meet all, and I repeat all, four tests of a variance as required by, and then I repeat, as required by section 45, bracket one of the Planning Act. <laughs> These proposed variances are not desirable for the appropriate use and development of the applicant's property as this development will not maintain compatibility with the environmental integrity and character of the surrounding shoreline area. Therefore, I would request that you deny this application. Thanking you for your time and understanding, and I look forward to your upcoming decision. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Um, Rob, would you like to speak to the couple of issues that Mr. Ward spoke to? First one's about the septic. Yeah, by all means. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so in terms of guidance as it relates to the location of, of septic systems, you know, obviously a big guide uh, from, from our perspective is, is what the province deems to be correct in some of its other documents, right? So. So in the context of, of the construction uh, of, of septic systems, the, the Ontario Building Code plays a large role. Uh, and the province has, through its wisdom, established that the minimum setback for septic systems is 15 meters, right, from a body of water. So from, from their perspective, they've, they've looked at this issue uh, and, and in, the full, in the fullness of time, uh, having regard for you know, the, the way that septic systems work uh, and have established that uh, the, the appropriate distance in order to avoid 
uh, a conflict between the septic system and the body of water is 15 meters, right? So we take we take that as 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 a good indication that um, that it's not unsafe, that it is safe, in fact, to, to build a septic system within that proximity of a body of water. Uh, and you know, the vast majority of septic systems, I would say, of you know buildings on the water would be within you know, 15 to 20 meters. I mean, uh, you know, this was, uh, uh, you know, until 2009 when our zoning bylaw changed, this was the norm, right? Um, to locate septic systems, a minimum of 15 meters from a high water mark. So we have some confidence that uh, the decision, if that's a decision that's made by the, by, by the committee, uh, wouldn't wouldn't have an adverse impact on the body of water. So, so in terms of, you know, the potential use of the property for a commercial purpose, you know, from our perspective, we, we have to consider the application, you know, based on the information that, were, that was provided in support of it. Uh, there's certainly no indication in the submission that uh, the, the property owner intends to use it for a commercial purpose. Uh, and as the, as Mr. Ward noted, it would not be consistent with our zoning bylaw. And we have the tools in place to ensure that that doesn't happen, right? That the commercial use, you know, doesn't, doesn't, uh, does it carry on? So, so if, if indeed at some point in the future uh, that community were to note that um, there there was some commercial activity, we have the the uh, the authority to uh, to ask the landowner to stop. We have the tools to ensure that he does stop, right? Through through fines uh, that are increasingly uh, more more punitive, and ultimately to ask for an injunction. So th there there are tools available, uh, Madam Chair, to address certainly that issue. And uh, I, I, I think that was the, the bulk. I mean, some of the other uh, assertions made by Mr. Ward uh, are refuted in, in my report. Uh, we have a disagreement, obviously, in, in, in whether or not what's being proposed is consistent with the four tests. But, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Clerk, was there anyone else that had um, registered to speak um, against this application? Madam Chair, we have no one else here for this application. All right, thank you very much. I will now bring it to committee. And I see um, Andy Mitchell had his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to uh, to uh, Rob, and I just want to uh, clarify this. I think you said it, but I just want to clarify it. The granting of a minor variance does not change the permitted use of the property, correct? That's a correct, that's correct. Uh, Donna? Yes, through you to Rob. Um, is, so it's being stated in the public record that um, a business cannot operate from a private residence in a residential area. I was wondering, would Mr. Crossman be able to store his excavation equipment in this garage? No, that, uh, you know, it's, it's so, so the bylaw permits, you know, someone to park a half ton or you know, that type of a commercial vehicle on their property, but um, the storing, uh, uh, you know, commercial equipment on the property is, is not permitted in the zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I had one other, Madam Chair, could I mention that? This is in relation to the septic system. There were two uh, houses or cottages on this property before and it's now merged into one property. Uh, were there septic systems uh, on those properties when Mr. Crossman bought them? Yep, yeah, both properties were developed with dwellings which also had uh, septic systems and they were all demolished and decommissioned. And do we have um, evidence of the distance from the high water mark where those septic systems were um, created? No, I only have information about the location of uh, the dwellings, um, not the septic system, the older septic system. Do we know if they were on the front of the dwellings? We, do we have any of in, information on that? 
I, I don't know that. Uh, perhaps the applicant would could could weigh in and, and let us know where they were. Mr. Crossman. Hello. Yes. Hello. Question asked. Uh, the, both both septic systems uh, at our original home there on the Lake Three Six Seven Gifford Drive was on the lake side. Uh, and Mrs. Claire Webbs, uh, who we purchased the property from at 363 Gifford Drive, was also on the lake side. Thank you, Donna. And um, this is kind of a comment, a question to Rob. Um, when the health unit gave their permission for this septic system to be ins installed in this location, they would no doubt have records of the previous septic system. And it's generally not allowed to put a septic system closer to the high watermark than it was in the past. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's, that's a general rule of, of thumb for sure. We've, we've um, used that as a, as a, as a means of, uh, of supporting uh, the, the reconstruction of septic systems is, you know, the fact that, um, you know, it's essentially replacing an older system or older systems. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess it would be correct to assume then that um, this placement is, if it's not exactly the distance from that the previous was, it's very close. Would that be a correct assumption? Yeah, I, I, I have no way to answer that with any degree of certainty, uh, Donna. Um, you know, based on the, you know, the, the former houses obviously were were more modest than 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 you know what's what's being proposed uh, today. But uh, you know, in accordance, with, you know, what what Mr. Crossman has advised is that they were between the house and the water. Uh, the older ones were; um, those houses were just about a hundred feet from, from the water. Um, so, which is, which is why Mr. Crossman's house has to be as far away from the water as, as, as it is. Um, and so it's, it's safe to assume that, you know, that they were between the house and the water, just how close is, is, is hard to tell. And the health unit does not give out, give us that information when they say that they have approved the septic system. I'm just making clarifications here. So they don't give out that information as to why they have approved the septic system. They just say they've approved it. Yeah, so they, they would have vetted the application uh, made by Mr. Crossman. They would have considered um, obviously the requirements of the Ontario Building Code and, and making their, their determination. And they would have looked at it. They would have looked at the history to ensure that you know clearly that the septic systems that were in place uh, were were properly uh, decommissioned, um, and if they had access to their files, if they had you know, access to uh, older permits, um, and and they could corroborate the location, that would have been part of their review as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Donna Anita. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe it's none of our business, but. Um, so the, um, the attached garage, it's saying is 2250 square feet, which is almost the size of, of some of the houses that are, that come through for applications. I'm just curious, do we know what that, um, 2200 square foot, uh, attached garage is going to be used for, or is it just like a five car garage? Yep. Yeah, so all I can say is that what's being disclosed is it's intended to be used for a residential purpose, but Again, perhaps Mr. Uh, Mr. Crossman can can provide his thoughts on, or his intentions and on, on their use as well. Mr. Crossman. You have to unmute yourself. Hello. Yes. Uh, to answer your question, I'm not going to be running my business out of there. It's running out of uh, 454 Irish Line, which we're paying huge uh, commercial tax on. Uh, that uh, waterfront property is going to be uh, for a five, uh, six car uh, garage. Uh, and I'm also uh, thinking about uh, down the road, 
uh, how uh, the smaller houses are being uh, uh, demolished or uh, knocked down and bigger homes built. I'm thinking about the future for resale. You don't want to stick a, a small 1200 square foot home on a, a big double lot, especially on Gifford Drive. Thank you. You're Is welcome. Anything else, Anita? No? Okay. All right. Um, we are going to move on to the next application. Uh, just so that for the benefit of people who've not been involved in this process before, we are hearing about each application and then we make a motion at the end of the applications list. So we will now hear uh, Mr. Lamar from about A3721, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, application A3721 uh, was provided to us by uh, uh, Chevy Edge as it relates to 2841 Antelope Trail in the Smith Ward. Um, this application is seeking permission to construct a garage that is 5.5 meters tall, as opposed to the maximum height permitted by, uh, as a right of four meters. Uh, the structure itself will be approximately 1400 square feet and one story in height. And once again, Madam Chair, I provided the committee with a summary of, of my thoughts on how uh, the particular application meets with the four tests, uh, in, the intent and purpose of the official plan and zoning bylaw, whether the, uh, the variance is appropriate for the development use of buildings and structures and, structures and whether or not it's minor. Um, so I, I do note in my report, Madam Chair, that we have in the past, of course, considered uh, several requests for increases in heights for accessory buildings where a special need is disclosed, uh, storage of recreational vehicles, etc. Uh, if we can establish that the proposal is appropriate given the, com the community context. Uh, in this particular context, I did ask the, the, the applicant to provide some insight into uh, uh, what, what has led to the need uh, for the taller structure and he has advised that uh, they own a cabin cruiser and it's its intention to, to store uh, the cabin cruiser in the building and uh, such a such a boat does require a large uh, overhead door which which is uh, which is uh, driving the need for the height of the building uh, once again um, uh, the, uh, the circulation did result in input from uh, from the health unit uh, they have no issue but have asked that uh, that uh, the applicant obtain uh, confirmation that it'll it, it'll be located sufficiently distant from the septic system uh, uh, the Conservation Authority has provided their thoughts as well. They have no objection. Uh, we have I've provided uh, the committee with four letters that I'd received uh, by the you know in time for the publication of my report. Since that time, we've received uh, all four of those. Madam Chair, were were comments that were in favor or supportive of the application. Uh, since that time, we've received seven other uh, letters that were supportive of the application. I'll. I'll, I'll read uh, the names and addresses of those who provided their support and a summary of their input. And in addition, we've received one up, one uh, notice uh, uh, of objection, and I'll read uh, I'll read that uh, letter into the record as well. So uh, the the seven applications that were received in, that uh, that were in support of the application. The first one was provided by uh, Matt Bringell, and he he lives at uh, two eight three one Antelope Trail. He just notes that he's spoken with the applicant, doesn't see an issue with the construction of the building as there's plenty of space on the lot and would be increasing the value of his home. There aren't any properties behind him and he thinks the applicant should be allowed to build his garage. The second was provided by Kim and Mark Ward. They live at 1662 Sable Court. And uh, they note that uh, they don't believe that the proposal will affect them and they wish the applicant the best. The third was provided by Tim and Kerry Ram, Rambau of 2926 Antelope Trail. They have no issue with the proposal and they note that every house needs a garage. Uh, the fourth one is provided by Michelle and Clive Less of 1663 Kudu Court. They have no problem with the proposal. Their home is directly adjacent to the proposed garage and, and view the proposal as adding to their privacy. Uh, 
that their their house is actually the closest to uh, to the garage uh, of of uh, the letters we've received. Now the fifth one is provided by Stephen Foster of 2032 Antelope Trail. He has no issue with the proposal. Now the sixth one is provided by Laura Abrams and Lori uh, Laura Abrams and Lori Mayhew of 1630 Elan Court. They have no issue with the proposal. The seventh is Joshua Kalsma of 2960 Antelope Trail. Uh, he notes that he holds the position of dockmaster on the Buckhorn Sands Property Owners Association. He doesn't believe that the pro proposal will ever adversely affect him or his family. Madam Chair, the, 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 the letter uh, that we received uh, in opposition uh, to the proposal was provided by Joe Duff of um, 1634 Elan Court. And I'll, I'll read his uh, submission. Uh, into the record. So he notes that he's become aware of an application being made to request relief from the zoning bylaw. And he he uh, correctly cites the intent and the uh, uh, subject uh, provisions that are being so the relief for uh, is for which the relief is being sought. Uh, he notes that I believe this is to be requested change from approximately 13.12 feet to approximately 18 feet of an increase of or an increase of 37% of the standard height restriction. Further, if I read the proposed plan and layout properly, this 1400 square foot structure will exceed the basic footprint of the current main residence, approximately 1200 square feet by 17%. It is proposed to be set back in the furthest corner of the lot and substantially disconnected from the main family structure. There's now a two driveway entrance to this lot where one has always been deemed to be sufficient in the past. As well, there's a very generous open space between the road access and the shed garage storage space. Uh, uh, my understanding is that many significant two-car garages with, with reasonable attic space would be approximately 600 square feet or 24 and a half by 24 and a half. So this proposed structure is approximately 2.33 times the two-car garage footprint. As a concerned resident of Borkhorn Sands community, I have seen increasing activity to challenge our community rules and township bylaws carry out more non-residential actions and jeopardize the long-standing community and purely residential principles. Whether relevant to this request for variance, the open space I reference above has had a rotation of boats on trailers and other mechanical equipment flow through it, and I suspect there may be much more to come. I would always support my neighbors and their ambitions to improve their residential properties, but I cannot see why this variance request is necessary. As the committee clearly knows, our residents can make building additions without the worry of general neighbor neighborly oversight by adhering to regular to existing regulations and is when the structures seek variance relief that comments both for and against may be forthcoming i'm unaware of any significant attempt to advise community residents of the reason and proposed use of the structure as a result we are left to speculate on our own given that this has only come out to general community public notice a few days ago i have no option but to voice my opposition to this variance at this time I would like to receive confirmation of receipt of this email and res results of the ruling on the variance request and remain anon uh, anonymous unless this dismisses, diminishes my submission. So I did confirm with um, uh, with um, Mr. Duffy that uh, in order for us to consider his submission, that he would have to dis we would have to disclose his name and his address, and and uh, and I did confirm with him that that was uh, that was okay. Um, yeah, so I guess in response to, uh, to, 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 to some of these comments, Madam Chair, we, we did confirm uh, with, with the landowner that it is not his intention to use the building for a commercial purpose. Uh, I did confirm with, uh, with Mr. Edge that uh, the township zoning bylaw does not permit commercial use of his property. Uh, so he's well aware of that. Uh, not unlike uh, the debate we had with uh, the previous application, Madam Chair, we do have uh, the authority and the tools required to ensure that uh, should that occur, that uh, that the uh, the commercial activity uh, stop. Uh, and those are the tools we would use in this context. Uh, again, we consider the application at face value, uh, and uh, the the input or the uh, assertion being made by the applicant is that they are not intending to use it for a commercial purpose. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand that the uh, owner, Chevy Edge, is on the line. Is there anything you wish to add to this report? 
Uh, hello, everyone. No, uh, that is it. I just want it for my cabin cruiser. It costs a lot of money to store them at a marina every winter. And I am a licensed marine mechanic, and I would like to do some of my own maintenance on my boat over the winter months because I'm laid off. That's the only reason I'm looking for the extra height. Thank you. Um, then there is uh, someone else that is in support, Stacy Sullivan. Is there anything you wish to add? Move it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so Chevy's just a friend and neighbor of ours, and we just wanted to uh, just participate tonight just in support of, of uh, him building this garage. That's really all we had to add. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Clerk, was there anyone who had registered in opposition for tonight? Madam Chair, we have no one else here for this application. Thank you very much. I'll pull it to committee. Any questions? Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Essentially the same question I asked Rob last time and we just asked him to clarify. So the approval of the minor variance would not change the permitted use and you have various tools and approaches that you could take should uh, use be uh, undertaken that is not permitted in the area. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Have there been any other questions? All right, seeing none, we will move on to the next application, Rob, A3821, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. This application is provided to us by Fred and Chris, Christine Emmerich, and it relates to 704 Maryland Boulevard in the Smith Ward. The applicant is seeking a reduction in the setback uh, from the front yard of 7.5 meters to 4.73 meters to a, an existing garage and 6.09 meters to a proposed addition. I note in my report, Madam Chair, that the uh, proposed addition is 7.8 square meters or 84 square feet in size and will be one story in height. And that uh, in addition, the variance will recognize a non-complying non location of an existing 64 square meter or 688 square foot uh, detached garage that was constructed in 2004 prior to the Emirates purchase of the property. Um, again, as is customary, I've provided the committee with a summary of my thoughts on how the application meets with the, the four tests. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, they, it, it does. Uh, I do believe it's uh, it meets the general intended purpose of the township sufficient time and zoning bylaw that it is an appropriate uh, form of development and that, that the proposal is minor in nature. Um, in terms of uh, input from uh, commenting agencies, uh, we have received uh, input from the health unit who advised that they have uh, no objection. The Conservation Authority has also provided their thoughts. Um, and they have asked that, uh, in addition to the note that, um, that the application is gonna require uh, a permit from them uh, to, to construct the addition, They've also noted that uh, it would be appropriate for them to also submit a, a planting plan, given its proximity to a hydrologic feature. Uh, so that uh, that will form part of, uh, of the conditions uh, uh, for the variance, Madam Chair. We did review the application for uh, uh, in, in relation to the M uh, Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sports checklist that have established that uh, in this context, no archeological assessment is warranted. Uh, given that uh, the, the, the size and shape of the addition will, will essentially fall in what was excavated to construct the dwelling. So there's no purpose in, in conducting that review, Madam Chair. Um, that's, uh, that's my report. Thank you very much. I understand that uh, the owner, Mr. Fred Emmerich, is here on the line. Is there anything you wish to add, Mr. Emmerich? Hello, good evening. Uh, no, nothing to add. I'd just like to thank Rob for his comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Clerk, was there anyone that registered to speak against this application? 
Um, I have no one else here for this application. Thank you very much. I'll bring it to the committee. Are there any questions? Neither. This isn't a question so much as a comment when I'm looking at the uh, key map. It almost looks like a patchwork quilt, the way the, the different lots are sort of laid out. And I'm assuming that's so that each lot would have access to the waterfront because uh, the 704 obviously is a sort of triangle shaped at the top and then goes narrow down to the waterfront. Um, was that uh, when the subdivision was being proposed, was that sort of an idea of the developer to to create the lots to make them look the way they are? Yeah, I'm through, Madam Chair. Yeah, that's, it's hard to say what, what, what was, because this, this does have quite a bit of age to it. Of course, this is not a configuration that you would see today. But uh, at the time, uh, somebody thought it was a good idea to have these odd shaped lots that provide each lot with some, some measure of water frontage and some measure of area wide enough to, to, you know, to, to, to sustain a dwelling and, and a septic system. So it's, it's relatively unique and it's not something we see elsewhere in, in the township. But, yeah. okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, we'll move on, Rob, to A4021, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this application was provided by Ian and Kristen Frost, uh, by Holly Richards, uh, their agent, uh, Holly Richards Conley, and it relates to uh, 1367 Theona Drive in Ennismore Ward. Uh, this, in this instance, uh, Madam Chair, the applicants are seeking relief to allow for an increased lock coverage for accessory structures from 5% to 7.63%. And in addition, uh, for an increase in height for accessory structures from 4%, for, for, sorry, from four meters to 4.47 meters. Uh, and that would be to uh, permit the construction of a 600 square foot, one story detached garage. Note in my report uh, that uh, the, the proposal includes the demolition of an existing 373 square foot bunky and deck. Uh, to and then of course to to replace that roughly in the same location with the construction of the detached garage with a storage loft above it and I, I note that in this context um, this is a pretty typical garage size uh, for residential in a residential context and even its small size you know uh, triggers the need for a lot coverage variance largely due to the fact that the lot is fairly small. Um, and the additional height they've noted is required because they, they don't have a basement in, uh, the, in the existing dwelling. And so they do, they do have a need for uh, the storage, uh, for storage. So their intent is to use the, uh, the loft area for storage of, of goods. Um, in terms of input from permitting agencies, uh, the health unit, uh, they advise that uh, the location of the garage uh, has been confirmed that it is properly located uh, and, and set back from uh, the holding uh, the holding tank. And the Congress Conservation Authority has also provided uh, a, a, a letter indicating that they don't they have no no opposition to the application. Simply that uh, a, a permit will be required and the uh, the typical uh, requirement for um, the planting plan given it given the proposed structure's proximity to uh, to the hydrologic feature. Uh, we have considered the application as it relates to compliance with the uh, Ministry of Citizenship and Culture, Tourism and Sports uh, checklist for uh, archaeological assessments. What I note in my report is that uh, um, there's an existing bunkie roughly in the location, the proposed location for the garage. In addition, a new holding tank has been constructed uh, again, within two meters of the proposed location, that the entire area has been excavated recently, and so there really is no uh, no purpose in uh, requiring an archaeological assessment. Uh, if there was anything, of course, uh, it would have been disturbed by uh, existing construction. Uh, I do and note in my professional opinion that I believe the four tests that are uh, that are summarized in the report uh, are are being met. Thank you very much. I understand that the agent is present, Holly Richards Conley. Is there anything you wish to add to that, Holly? Uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Um, just one little thing. Um, 
I submitted two letters of support from the neighbors on either side with the application, and I didn't see those as part of the application. So I'm not sure if Rob has a copy of those and would like to read them. If not, um, I can also read them. I'm just feverishly looking through my, my file. <laughs> I'm sorry I missed that. Uh, Okay, I do have them. So okay, see the first the first letter that I have here is from the resident at 758 Douglas Drive, AJ Clements. Uh, and uh, he notes that our neighbor, our neighbors, the fronts, the frosts are applying for a variance with respect to lot coverage to enable them to build a 24 by 28 garage on their property. It's my understanding that they are removing the existing bunkie in the back shed in order to come within 100 square feet of the allowable coverage. As long as these buildings are removed and the normal setbacks are observed, we have no objection to this minor variance. So the second letter, uh, Madam Chair, comes to us from Johnny uh, Baychuk, who lives at 1665 uh, uh, Fiona Drive in Ennismore Ward. Uh, they are the neighbors of uh, the Frosts. Uh, we are aware of the proposed 24 by 28 garage. They wish to construct on their property. We are in favor of such construction and do not have any issues with it. Holly, is there anything else? Uh, no, Rob covered it off. Um, the additional sort of storage space above the garage, which is sort of where we needed the additional height was simply because it's a 1300 square foot small um, house. They um, recently sold their house in the city and are moving with a bunch of kids and there's no basement, so they have no space for anything. Okay, thank you. Deputy Clerk, is there anyone that has registered to speak against this application? We have no one else here for this application, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Rob, we'll move on to A4121, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. This, this application was provided to us by Holly, Holly Richards Conley on behalf of her clients, Gordon and Claudia Burrell. And the application relates to 2485 Hiawatha Lane and Smith Ward. And this application is seeking relief from uh, 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 several uh, provisions in our zoning bylaw. Firstly, to increase lot coverage for accessory structures from 5% to 6.7%. Uh, secondly, to increase the maximum height of an accessory structure from 4 meters to 4.09 meters. Thirdly, to decrease the maximum setback from high watermark from 30 meters to 17.98 meters to a dwelling, and from 30 meters to 13.2 meters to a deck. And lastly, uh, to reduce the minimum side yard setback uh, for, for a boathouse from 10 meters to, to 3 meters. And Madam Chair, this is to permit the construction of a 265.8 square meter, 2861 square foot dwelling with a 96.3 square meter, 1036 square foot deck and covered porch, a 104 square meter, 1120 square foot one story detached garage, and a 53.5 square meter, 576 square foot boathouse. Once again, I've, I've provided uh, you know, the committee with a summary of, uh, of how I believe these, these variances uh, are consistent with the four tests of the Planning Act. I note in my report that uh, the proposal does include the demolition of an existing dwelling that is 16.1 meters from the high watermark. It uh, is going to be demolished in its entirety. The new dwelling would be set back 17.99 uh, meters from uh, the high water mark, and this is consistent with the zoning bylaw regulations, which do not permit further encroachments and encourage uh, buildings to be located further back from the high water mark. Uh, the applicant does note that um, the reason for uh, the uh, reduction in the setback for the boathouse is relates to uh, the, an existing uh, structure at the waterfront, uh, a large patio that uh, they want to uh, maintain. And so they have a limited ability to, to locate uh, the boathouse without, uh, without uh, damaging that, uh, that particular structure. So that's kind of pushing the boathouse towards, uh, towards uh, the uh, lot line. 
uh, yes, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions, but the, those, those are my, my thoughts. In terms of um, uh, input from uh, uh, commenting agencies, uh, we did receive uh, comments from the, uh, the health unit. Uh, they have no objection and just note that they, a, a permit from them will be required. Um, the Conservation Authority has provided uh, their thoughts. They have no objection. They note that uh, there will be a need for a permit and also given its location in proximity to a hydrological feature, they will require a planting plan uh, so that uh, those, those uh, will, be, will, will form part of the conditions that, uh, uh, that I've recommended for the committee. Uh, and again, uh, this is customary, we have reviewed uh, the application uh, for, for as it relates to uh, the requirement for an ar archeological assessment and an assessment would be required in this context. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, the agent, Holly Richards Conley, is there anything else you wish to add to Rob's report? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I'm just here to answer any questions. And I did want to let the committee know that the archaeological assessment has already been completed and nothing of cultural significance was found. Okay. Is there anyone else? Um, I understand that the owner, Gordon Burrow, is online. Is there anything you wish to add, Mr. Burrow? No, not at this time, unless there's any questions. All right, thank you. I'll bring it to committee. Any questions? All right, seeing none, I am looking for a motion. Jerry Heron, seconded by Anita Locke. All in favor? Carried, thank you. There are no deferred matters. Um, the minutes of committee's adjustment meeting of June the 22nd, moved by Andy, seconded by Donna. All in favor? Carried, thank you. And adjournment. Gary and Anita, all in favor? That's Gary, thank you. Our next meeting is August the 10th. Thank you. And colleagues will begin in five minutes, so that'll be 6-12, thank you.
a bit of rain in the village there tonight, Andy? It did. It did for about five minutes. Yeah, I think the bigger storms have kind of went to the, the east and west of us here and not a whole lot coming right up through our corridor here. So which is all right then. That's maybe a quarter of an inch out there. So a touch. A bit, a bit. We could use more. Okay, colleagues, I think we will call the meeting to order. It's Donna and Jerry, as soon as they light up, we'll go. There's Jerry. And let's wait for Donna. And there is Donna. Okay, colleagues, I'm going to call the uh, regular council meeting to order uh, for Tuesday, July the 13th at 6 13. Uh, I want to begin with our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Nishisagi and Ashabek. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. We also ask that we all observe a moment of silence so that council, staff, and members of the public can quietly reflect on our duty to the community that we are trying to serve. Thank you. Uh, members of the public, staff, presenters, and members of council, please be advised that meetings are broadcast and recorded and made available on the internet. Colleagues, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof? I will declare item 632 in correspondence. The correspondence has been signed by my son, so I will declare a comment. Uh, we'll move on to the, um, to, so when we get to that part, we'll separate that out if, and ask Sherry to take care of that part of it. Uh, we have the minutes for the June 22nd uh, meeting. Any questions? Anybody like to move? Anita to move it, Donna to second it. Any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Uh, for deputations tonight, very pleasant deputation. We have some introductions of new staff, and I'm not sure who's going to do that. Um, I'll do that, Mr. Chair. Oh, Rob, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Chair. I, I do have the, <clears throat> the distinct pleasure to uh, introduce three members of, of my staff. Uh, I think we'll start with, with Per Lumberg. Per has been hired to uh, the fill the position of planner. Per holds a master's of urban planning, urban and regional planning from the Queen's, uh, from Queen's University and is a member of the Canadian Institute of Planners. Uh, he comes to us from after having worked uh, for the County of Peterborough for six years. So most recently as a planner. So he has a pretty good sense of, of uh, planning policies in, 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 the, uh, in the County of Peterborough and understands the culture here as well. So Per started uh, with the township on the 28th of June and is uh, slowly, <coughs> slowly being introduced to uh, the numerous files we have underway. So I don't know, Pear, if you wanted to uh, just, uh, yeah, go oh, there you are, you are your, your yep. camera's yep. on there. Here. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for welcoming me, Robert. Um, I, I think I actually started on the 28th, so a little more recently. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been here for about two weeks now and uh, certainly enjoying my time here and, and Rob's great to work with, so I'm sure I'll be seeing uh, your worship and members of council regularly uh, in, in the coming months and, we, and years. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Per. Uh, next, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Mark Chang. Uh, he's been hired to build the position of de uh, development approvals technician. Uh, Mark is a recent graduate from the University of Waterloo School of Planning with a major in urban, urban planning and uh, with a, sp a specialization in land development. Uh, Mark does bring with him some experience working for, at the provincial level in both the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. His official start date is actually tomorrow. So uh, welcome, Mark. You want to say, uh, say hello? Thank you. Hi. Um, hope you guys can hear me. Um, I'm very excited to start tomorrow. Um, yeah, and it's, it's so great to meet everyone. And um, yeah, thank, thank you so much for um, welcoming me. 
Yeah, you're welcome, Mark. And uh, the last uh, individual I'd like to uh, to uh, to greet is Rita O'Grady. Uh, Rita has been hired to fill the position of permit intake technician. So Rita is a graduate of the Business Administration Program at Sir Sanford Fleming College, and she brings with her several years' experience, direct experience as a permit coordinator, uh, building and planning assistant for two municipalities in the county of Peterborough, and her official start date is July 19th. Hello, Rita. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, I'm excited to start uh, next Monday, and it's nice to meet you all virtually and hopefully see you around the office in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and, and, and thanks to the three of you. We I uh, look forward to working with you. It's exciting to have you aboard. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, Robert will be sending lots of work your way. So uh, we look forward to, uh, to uh, working with you. So thank you and uh, have a good night and we look forward to seeing you at the office. Okay, colleagues, uh, we'll move on to question period. Uh, Madam Clerk, any questions uh, submitted? Uh, no questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to municipal officers and staff reports for direction. And the first report is from uh, Janice on our work plan second quarter update. Uh, Janice, are you there? Yeah, there you are. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. So, yeah, I believe we do have all of our managers here with the exception of uh, Rick, who wasn't available this evening. Um, so we'll just, as per normal, I guess, go through the work plans and any questions that uh, council has for us, we will try and address for you. Okay, hey, thank you. We'll go through these one at a time. So we'll start with the Chief Administrative Officer. Any questions on that one? Anita. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is with regards to the Community Transportation Grant. Um, I think last month we got rider stats on the, the, um, the bus, the link. Um, and also with regards to the program extension and additional funding approved. I'm, I'm assuming that that's the... Uh, letter 6A, six point uh, under correspondence with regards to the CT program um, extension, is that the link? So I'm just curious, do we have any rider stats say for the last two weeks? And also with regards to um, the correspondence item 6A, six? A, six? Yes, so, so I believe the letter in correspondence is indeed the letter uh, confirming the extension of the grant for another two years and also um, we received an additional 800, approximately $885,000 as part of that announcement. So that was um, absolutely wonderful news for the township. So, so that's, uh, that's great. And we're very grateful for that. In terms of the ridership stats, I don't have any. I'm not sure, Ange, have you seen any ridership stats? Or I, Donna's waving at me. Maybe she has those ridership stats. Yes, I have them prepared for my portfolio. Do you want them now, Anita? Okay, so um, they are down slightly for the week of hmm, July 5th to July 9th. Route 31 had 28, Route 32 had seven, and the um, fees are still free till the end of July. And I was going to make a, a comment about this that I think he, um, our people in charge at the office might want to look at the routes and um, take some stats and possibly create some links into more populated subdivisions. Of course, especially in Ennismar, I'm like a broken record. Many people need to get a ride to catch the bus and this isn't convenient or sustainable. So I think they'll have to be a little bit more creative. I'm not exactly sure how many little loops there are in Bridge North. I know there's an extra loop in Lakefield and I think they do go up past the school and the library in Bridge North and basically in Ennismore, they just go from community care straight down Robinson Road and they have a few stops. So I, I really feel that we would get a better ridership if possibly we did a loop into Youngstown and maybe Cedarvale, they're just right off the, the Robinson Road. And I um, think that might help. Maybe even go up as far as um, 
Earl Avenue, that, that subdivision there, possibly, although I think there's more younger people in that subdivision. So the group would have to take some statistics to see how many um, potential riders there might be if they, because it is an added expense to, to extend the route, so. But really it wouldn't be sustainable at these rates. Gary? Uh, thank you. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here on because I know we're doing work plans right now, but I guess my question is this, and this is something that we can come back maybe next meeting. If we're footing the bill for this and we don't have the government subsidies, what's our break even point on numbers of riders um, for us to break even on this? So if we can maybe get those numbers, that'd be great. And I'd like to know what they charge too, because I don't know that. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I, I'm sure staff has taken a note of, to come back with that information. Yeah, okay. for, for sure. We can come back with some, some information. Of course, it's going to take some time to develop um, the system. And, and we know that. And now that we have the two-year extension and the additional funding, for sure, we have a better opportunity to um, see the growth in, in, the, um, in the routes and in the service and make adjustments to make it as efficient and as effective as possible. And then at the end of the day to evaluate how we can make it uh, sustainable in the long term. Thank you, Janice. Anything else on the CAO so, section? Okay, we'll move on to the building and planning department. Anybody have anything to ask about that? Uh, Anita. Um, it's not a question so much as a, as a comment. I see that our um, second quarter for 2021 is up 36%. So even in spite of the, the pandemic, um, kudos to the building department and I guess to all of the developers and the builders out there that, uh, you know, I think we, I was kind of concerned that there would be a downturn, but actually seeing that we're up 36% um, year to date over last year, I think that's, that's great news. Thank you, Anita. Anybody else? No. Okay. Uh, so we also have the uh, we also have the dashboard from our following up our building and planning uh, uh, consultants report. Is there anything on that one? No. Okay. The stats. I needed to just sort of spoke to the stats. Uh, um, I just I had a question about the stats myself, and I might be reading this wrong, Bob. So to the point that Anita made, um, we've got 36% year over year more per permit. When we down and look at construction value, the increase is only 3%. And, you know, I, I can guess why that is, but am, am I reading that right? Yeah, that's that's what the, the stats show. I, I think I think we must have had, and I, I can't tell you which building, we must have had like one or two large buildings last year, uh, early on in, in the new year, uh, that kind of pushed the year-to-date uh, construction values up that we haven't had uh, yet this year. I think that, that's probably part of it. And I think the total number last year, I mean, last year, the second quarter was, you know, that was kind of the height of COVID, you know, it was, and so I think there was, uh, there was probably a delay and, and, and some hesitancy maybe, and, and we weren't, you know, in a position to issue permits for a period of time. So that kind of maybe inflates uh, year-to-date numbers for this year. Uh, this is a pretty typical year, uh, 220 about this time. So uh, still quite busy. Uh, uh, and, and you know, even with the challenges that are associated with, with uh, you know, not being open and, and whatnot, there's been, uh, you know, a, quite an effort by, by uh, my staff to, uh, to to exceed all of the parameters that uh, that the province sets out in terms of turnaround times for the issuance of permits, and I, I can tell you that's that's not the case everywhere in Ontario. Uh, but uh, this group uh, has managed to uh, to exceed those those uh, key performance indicators, and I, uh, you know I certainly thank them when I get an opportunity to do that uh, because uh, it does take quite quite an effort. Thank you, Rob. And speaking of KPIs, does anybody have a specific question on the KPIs that were provided to us? 
Okay, not seeing any, we move on to the Corporate and Community Services Clerk's Department. Anybody have any questions of that? Uh, okay, Donna and then Anita. Yes, thank you to Angie. Um, I've already asked Annie, Angie some questions about the NSMORE CIP, um, but I'm just wondering, I didn't ask this, when she thought that the detailed design was going to be started. I know you've been crazy busy, but I just wondered if you had some sort of idea of when you would start that design plan. Yeah, thank you, Donna. And uh, I, I do apologize. I know this is an important project for you. Um, yeah, we have to issue a uh, request uh, for um, a proposal uh, or a quotation to have an engineer actually do the work for us. So that's where we need to start. And then, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, so we do need to do that first and then we would start the detailed design work after that. So it might start a little bit later this year, that detailed design work. So if we could do that over um, uh, the winter months and, and have a design done by the end of Q1 in 2022, that would put us in good shape so we could be project ready to uh, add it into the budget. Okay, uh, and Anita, you had, or Donna, was that it? Okay. Okay. I know it, this is once again just a comment and a congratulations. I know that um, I think Angie had sent us an email with regards to some of the most recent funding announcements, but we see the, the research funding opportunities, grant preparation, identifying projects and reporting and uh, Megan is doing an awesome job um, and somehow she can find all sorts of money that's out there that's really helpful to move our projects along. So I just wanted to specifically mention uh, Megan's um, endeavors to to find all this this grant money out there. Uh, thanks, Anita. Megan's actually on, uh, she's uh, present at the meeting and I know she would have appreciated hearing that. She's a superstar when it comes to grant applications for sure. So we've got Sherry, and then I think we'll go back to Donna. Yeah, I did. can you just remind me when the council communicator are going to be dealing with it again? Uh, it, it'll be the fall. I, I don't have the exact uh, timeline, Sherry, but um, I think it was September we were going to get back on track with that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Donna, you had another question? No, I didn't. I was just waving at Megan and thanking her. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple of quick questions. Uh, so the digitization, digitization project, when do we expect to get underway with that? Uh, we're just waiting, Andy, for the uh, transfer payment agreement from the province. Uh, so we can get started on it as soon as we, uh, we get the agreement from the province that we can go ahead. Okay. And under the communication and marketing um, uh, initiative that we uh, put forward for this year. We've got some money into that. Have, have we uh, done anything on our cooperative marketing campaigns? Uh, I'll, I'll actually let uh, Megan uh, speak to that. Uh, Megan, I think you're there if you want to liven up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we haven't done anything um, as of yet, but we are kind of waiting um, until stage three, just because it, it didn't seem fair to be advertising certain businesses that were open while others weren't allowed. But um, we kind of have, well, I'm thinking of a different approach this year, um, rather than just uh, the typical um, commercials like the shop local, eat local, that sort of thing. I think um, with a few conversations I've had with Peterborough and the Corth as economic development um, and Peterborough and the Corth as tourism, um, they've actually kind of been saying really the best way to be helping businesses right now is to be doing some more cooperative advertising. So whether it's the township taking on the brunt of a lot of the advertising and marketing, um, it's just that a lot of businesses right now with COVID-19 have had to spend a lot more money on getting themselves ready, appropriate PPE, whether it's um, renovations to their facilities, that sort of thing. Um, so it's just something that they're not willing to pay for right now. Advertising may not be top of the budget. Um, so I think this way, we're able to help our businesses in the way 
that works best for them. Like, so it's similar to the business reopening program in a way, but we're going to focus primarily on um, just contributing a lot more of those marketing and uh, those kind of dollars for them instead. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on the clerk's department? No? Okay, we'll move on to the financial services. Any questions under financial services? Okay, Donna and Anita. Yes, uh, through you to Lane. This is on page three, the very last item. It, it, it would have been here before, but I never noticed it before. Develop presentation to condo boards and develop su supporting agreements to clarify roles and responsibilities. I just wondered, were we having some difficulties with condo boards and um, what's the reason for having to do this? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, it's just really to address the fact that um, condominium developments with respect to water and sewer are treated differently. And uh, with respect to turn-ons, turn-offs, the fact that the condos actually have to set aside funding for the services which are located within their lands. Uh, so it's not the same as the typical uh, homeowner that just has frontage on a municipal road. Uh, so it's really just to outline that to them, ensure that they're aware of it, and work with our operating authority and the boards to ensure that everybody has a, a clear line of communication on that. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Anita? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this might not have anything to do with the other, but the, the work that's being done on Fraser, Fraser Street right now, is that is that with regards to improving the Smith Street corridor? Is that, is that a totally different project that's happening on Smith Street between, I'm sorry, on Fraser Street between Smith and George? Because I've had some people asking me like what's going on down there. Yeah, do you, Mr. Chair, that's, that's definitely part of that project. So it's tying in the Lakefield South Development Area. It's uh, providing sewer service to the residents of Smith Street. And of course, we need to get to the actual main uh, where we can deposit that to the George Street pumping station. And that's right at the corner of, of George Street there. So yeah, that's definitely uh, all part of that uh, major project that's gonna tie in Lakefield South. Okay. Um, if somebody else has, I have a question. Elaine, uh, where do we stand on our asset management plan? Is there any particular work we're doing on it in 2021? Uh, yes, you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're, we're trying to finish up the CCTV work on the stormwater management um, infrastructure. Uh, so we have uh, all of our water mains, all of our sewer mains. We'll be updating our roads needs study and the, uh, the stormwater is the last component of that. Uh, to, to be completed. And then uh, once we have all of our data in line, uh, we'll be looking at uh, getting some specialized support in, in key areas. And our big question uh, at that point will be, do we, uh, do we go to one consultant to take a look at writing the report or do we look at more specialized key areas? Uh, definitely the, uh, the extension until next year provided us with that flexibility to be able to look at that and ensure it's a, it's a plan that we're going to you know, not just sit on the shelf, but be able to incorporate in our uh, in our annual planning. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Don't see any, we'll move to the fire department. Any questions on the fire department? Donna. Yes, sir, you to Gord. Um, Gord, I'm just wondering if we've had any problems with campfires related to a change in our burn bylaw? Oh, actually, through you, Chair, we uh, have not had hardly a call. Uh, I think this last weekend we had a, an email come in from Woodland, Woodland Acres, which they are not supposed to burn. So, again, uh, just a case that, that, you know, she really needs to call 911 so we can maybe follow up and find where the smoke's coming from. She had to shut her windows a couple of nights in a row. So, but no, it's, uh, it's been, you know, we've had quite a few inquiries about, uh, about it. And actually 
a lot of people are saying that, you know, well, that makes sense. I, I kind of like that. So if it's not like we get a lot of people. I think we've had one or two in the last month that have, since it's went out that, uh, you know, that, that helps me with uh, my backyard that, you know, I'm, yeah, this is, this gives me something to go with and uh, they can, they can do measurements. So, and we just have to reassure them that, you know, you just can't burn in a certain areas. So, and yeah, we always get the same ones. And uh, we've had two in Lakefield that are uh, new to the area. And, you know, again, it's one of those things that they just don't check if there's a bylaw. And so it's just a little education, but yeah, things are running good, Don. Yeah, it really is. But, so. Yeah, well, that's good, Gordon. And I just had one other question. Have you had any complaints about fireworks, firecrackers? I've had a lot of complaints it seems like um they go many weekends instead of just a select few i just wondered if you've been hearing about that uh we had one it was after the long weekend it was that two weekends ago that uh, she said it was quite noisy but you know just like what we, what can we do about it and i said well if it's if it's the case if it's after a certain time like the a noise bylaw then you know you can contact police and whatnot like that but uh, nothing major here that that's really come across our desk that uh, people are really complaining about and actually i you know because where i live i'm up high I, I just really i'm kind of disappointed i haven't seen a lot of fireworks going off so or i can hear them and and everything else around here but uh, yeah it's it's been relatively quiet canada day on saturday night it was a couple of good shows that i'm thinking that hmm uh, where did they get the fireworks? And if something is as big as I seen down in Kachanook Lake, uh, they had need signed off. But if these were brought in, it, it, it's hard to hard for us to, you know, stop that. Again, you know, I, we went through this a little while ago. That how how do you stop every hardware store? How do you stop every little corner store from selling fireworks? So. It's, it's, uh, it, you know, unless the province puts it in, outlaws it, and I don't think that's going to happen. I think I've seen a lot of complaints in Peterborough on the news in the last couple of days. So that's a, that's a big factor, especially in a really built up area like that. I wasn't suggesting that we change it, but I was just curious to see if you were hearing complaints like I was. Yeah, and, and I think it was a new neighbor that came in and, and she just didn't realize how, Mm, it might be a little crazy sometimes in the long weekends and whatnot. So, but I said, well, let us know if it happens every weekend in the same area and we can deal with those, those people. Come. So we've had those experiences before where certain, certain young people just like to carry on and try to nip that in the bud a little bit. Okay, is that it for the fire department? Okay, we will move on to human resources. Any question on human resources? Okay, don't see any. Uh, library, any questions on the library? Anita. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, uh, one comment and one question. So the comment is that um, when we look at our total circulation second quarter for 2021, it's nice to see that it's creeping up slowly to the 2018, 2019 levels. Obviously, 2020 was, you know, about 50% from the previous year, but it's nice to see that the, that the cir total circulation numbers are going up and um, there's been some really great programs that um, staff have put together in spite of the fact that the, the, we haven't been able to operate at full capacity. Um, so my question is with regards to volunteers, I guess once we more or less go back to full um, operation, uh, will there be enough um, volunteers um, such as has been in the past? Because obviously the volunteers have had to kind of take a back seat um, for the past year or so. Um, so I'm just curious um, with regards to uh, volunteer numbers. Okay, is Sarah here? Don't 
who's here. Uh, Sarah is not in attendance. Okay, so um, somebody, uh, Janice or, or, okay, Donna, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, they're gradually bringing the volunteers back, the ones that feel comfortable and um, they have a reintroducing program. So uh, most volunteers have indicated that they would come back. It's just that they want to be sure that they're comfortable and, and safe. So I think we'll get most of them back. I think that's the main question, wasn't it? Sorry, I wasn't totally listening to the question because I thought somebody else would be answering it. No, I think you nailed it. Okay, anything else in the library? Seeing any, we'll move on to Parks and Rec. Any questions about Parks and Rec? Okay. Okay. Um, I had a question. Is Mike there? Yes, uh, I am, sir. Uh, Mike, with the uh, introduction of step three, have you heard from any of our users for the fall? Um, not so much for the fall. We've heard uh, um, a fair bit for um, the next uh, four to six weeks. Um, the hockey groups are just starting to get all of their details, their requests and whatnot um, in. So um, within the next week or so, I'm sure we'll have a lot more of an indication of what the fall will look like. Right now, we're really just trying to get to Labor Day, making sure that we get step three started well um, and, uh, and make sure that it, you know whatever is allowed to happen, um, we get going. The groups have certainly gotten very good at doing their safety plans, those that have gotten started, which is a lot of the youth groups and a few of the adult groups. Donna? Yes, I just wanted to add that I had a call today from the Shemong Lions and they're hoping to start a car show on August the 1st. And they just have to be sure that uh, of the numbers and all the things that are required. So that's good for them. Yes, through you, um, I did get a call from Keith and uh, Keith Elliott and Paul English. So I'll be touching base with them tomorrow. Um, and then once we know exactly what sort of numbers they're allowed, um, then we will communicate that, uh, that to them. Um, but I do foresee, since it is an outdoor event and since physical distancing is, is possible, I foresee some possible uh, uh, car shows on their Mondays, but it, it will certainly be only based on them completing the safety plans and then uh, and sticking to the new numbers. Thank you. Anybody else on Parks and Rec? Okay, not seeing any, we'll go to Public Works. Any questions on Public Works? Donna? Uh, I don't see um, Rick here. No, I don't think he's here tonight. Okay, so I think I've asked this question before, um, but I, I'm still mixed up. Uh, I know that Cow Island was quite a mess, and I see there's Harrington Line here. And I'm wondering if anybody knows if Harrington Line stretches into Cow Island. I was pretty sure it was to be uh, repaired this year. Uh, I'll check on that, Donna, and, and get back to you on that. I'm not sure the extent to which um, it's going around the whole area, but I will check. Well, the worst part of Cow Island was the entrance part. So I think the other side of the road is Harrington Line. So possibly um, they have fixed it, if that's called Harrington Line. But if you'd check, that'd be great. Will do. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, I think that completes it. So we need a motion to receive. Sherry seconded by Anita. All in favor? Carried.
Okay, we will we'll move on to Lane's second quarter financial update. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the report uh, builds on the, on the first quarter financial report. Um, and, and even though we are in June uh, and the financials are starting to shape, take shape for 2021, um, it is still early for some of our major capital projects. Uh, but I have provided some additional uh, comments in the cover report. And uh, we have actually, just for comparison purposes, included the budget amendments, which is the next item up on the agenda for council, just so that like year end figures and those types of things are comparable. Um, we have brought in our accumulated revenue from last year, taxation and the final billings have been completed. Um, you know, really strong building permit revenues as we discussed, good activity at the landfill site. Our, uh, our major area that we're concerned about now because of uh, COVID and the impacts on our recreation facilities, library facilities, those types of areas where we have lost revenues and lost fundraising potential. Um, I guess I'll, I'll leave the comments there and I can respond to any questions the council may have. Hey, colleagues, questions? So, Lane, I had a quick one. Department 25, are you going to need to redo that in view of the in view of the change in the um, funding, or is that the uh, is that for this year stay the way it is? Um, I I may get Angie to weigh in on that. I, I think based on how we had put it forward this year, uh, I think we've got our agreement in place uh, with the uh, the city. We haven't received any uh, billings yet, but we know what those are going to be. I guess it would only be if we ramped up uh, some of the pilot uh, this year, but I'm not sure if Angie's available to uh, comment on that. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I don't see that we would require a budget amendment right now unless we add to the to the service, which would add to the expense. Um, but, uh, you know, as Donna pointed out, we do plan to take a look at the routes um, to see where we can offer some uh, changes. So there could be a change. Okay, thank you. Anything else on that? If not, I'll take a motion to receive. From Anita, seconded by Diana. All those in favor? Carry. Okay, we will now stay with Lane, and now we're doing the budget amendment one and budget amendment two. Lane? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so, as, as noted, amendment number one is typical of what I would say is a housekeeping amendment, and it really just uh, updates the year to date accumulated revenue that we're pulling in, so the surplus or deficit that's coming in. And uh, in revising the uh, Ontario Municipal Partnership grant that's used to offset the arena deficits. So that's fairly standard. Uh, to date, Council has also already approved two budget amendments one with respect to the fire services grant that was received from the province, uh, and the other to do with the secret garden project at the Innersmore Waterfront Park. And as has been routine with the community improvement plan, if we have a good activity in that program, um, because we have it a reserve set up, uh, we have brought that forward uh, as well mid-year for council to take a look at. In uh, that way, we can ensure that we continue to pay out grants and keep the program running. Um, with respect to the CIP this year, um, because of the uh, impacts of COVID and some of the new initiatives that we put in this year, and because we were successful in receiving some additional grants uh, from the province re directly related to COVID recovery, we're suggesting that that's where the funding would come from this year. And then we'd still have money in reserve as well. So that's included in budget amendment uh, two as well. Questions, colleagues? Yes, Anita. Not a question, just a comment. I think your suggestion or recommendation with regards to the uh, the $100,000, um, the financial incentives funded through the Provincial Safe Restart and the Provincial COVID Recovery Grant. I think that's a, a really good suggestion of where that, that money can come from and where it can go towards. I think it's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Other comments? I would entertain a motion to approve those two amendments from Sherry, seconded by Donna. All those in favor? Those are carried. Thank you very much, Lane. Uh, we will now move on to our next uh, report, which is from Rob, the Cannabis Zoning uh, Bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I've drafted the report as uh, 
kind of the next step in, in our goal of uh, finding the, the correct regulation for uh, cannabis industry. Um, so I note in the report that uh, as it relates to the zoning bylaw aspect of, of that goal, we, uh, we are proposing to hold a public meeting on the 10th of August. Uh, and uh, I note that the Meridian Planning will be in attendance to respond to any questions from council and the public at that meeting. And it, uh, we would, uh, following that meeting, of course, make any adjustments that are necessary and then move forward with approval at a, at a, at a subsequent meeting. Um, more, more particularly, though, in this, in this particular instance, council did ask that uh, we consider two, two issues in addition to the zoning, and that was um, uh, whether or not, or the council wanted me to investigate uh, the odor nuisance bylaw, uh, the possibility of, of, of adding that to our, our tool chest. And secondly, they wanted us to, to seek a legal opinion with respect to uh, the township's authority to regulate cannabis production for personal medical use. So, uh, so the report kind of outlines what we were able to establish as it relates to, firstly, the odor nuisance bylaw issue. And we were able to find one example of such a bylaw that, that, that was passed by the town of Pelham uh, uh, in March of last year. So they've, uh, they've had it in place uh, for uh, a year and a bit. Um, we've managed to have a chat with, uh, with uh, their uh, enforcement staff and the development staff. Uh, and so essentially the, the bylaw is set up to, uh, to make uh, the production of, of odors uh, a nuisance if they, uh, if they exceed certain parameters, certain metrics. Uh, and there's two essential processes that, uh, that they use to establish whether or not an exceedance has been met. So there's a typical bylaw enforcement aspect of things whereby uh, uh, thresholds are set and, and then inspections are made to establish whether or not these th thresholds have been exceeded. <laughs> and uh, to date, there haven't been any exceedances, which it leads them to think that maybe they need to make some adjustments to those numbers. Um, and secondly, the bigger, I guess, more comprehensive aspect of their bylaw would see them uh, hire a third party and they've, they've just completed the RFP who will then monitor uh, the production of odor through a grid form uh, in accordance with an MOE guideline as, uh, as it relates to the odor production. Uh, and this firm will, will do the work at the at, at, at the cost of the industry so um, so at this point so if you're an industry uh, if you're part of a part of the cannabis industry and you're larger than 50 square meters you're going to uh, you're going to uh, uh, be part of the solution in terms of paying for the cost associated with this monitoring program so that that has led to a, to um, a challenge to the bylaw so the industry is challenging the bylaw and this of course will be heard at some point in the future uh, I do note in the report that you know really um, the the town of Pelham was was faced with quite a number of, of complaints related to to large uh, producers of cannabis. They have two producers that have a, a roughly eight hundred thousand square feet of of uh, green greenhouse and, and production space, uh, and so you know they're facing they're facing a considerable issue, uh, and and of course this this came to them. You know, in the absence of being in a position that, that we're in, right? So, so from our perspective, what we're what we've set up is a system whereby anybody who's wanting to to produce cannabis indoors will have to get a zoning bylaw amendment. And it's at that point that we'll introduce whatever whatever we whatever I guess scientifically is going to be required to ensure that the odor issues are properly mitigated, right? So, so that's a I guess that's a distinct difference between you know what what Pelham had to face uh, early on in, in this, uh, in, in, you know, this industrial boom and what, you know, the position that we're in, which, which I think we're in a much better position in terms of addressing or, or mitigating the problem before it actually starts. Of course, um, it's hard to mitigate uh, cannabis that's being grown outdoors, but, uh, but certainly indoors uh, we'll be in a position to ensure that uh, you know, whatever needs to take place, place scientifically to mitigate the order uh, will take place. And so that's that's a large part of the reason that I've come to conclude what I have in my report, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, and, and that is that um, I think we wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that we move forward with the adoption of a similar bylaw 
I think we should wait for the outcome of the challenges uh, to the bylaw that, that are that are currently being considered. Uh, and and, uh, and of course, we're, we're in a better position in that, that we, we do have the tools uh, necessary to address issues as they as they come to us. Uh, so as it relates to that's essentially the, the summary of the order nuisance bylaw aspect of the report. And in terms of the legal opinion, um, so we did we did establish, uh, we did ask uh, Aaron Berlis, our, our legal uh, consultants, to consider uh, our, our abilities as it relates to um, uh, our, um, using both uh, the, the zoning bylaw and the, the building code and fire code as tools to enforce uh, any any uh, nonconformities. Uh, um, Related to the, the medical cannabis aspect of things, that's always been a bit of a bit of a, a loophole, I guess, or a bit of a challenge for municipalities. And that the medical cannabis licensing program just does not include any notice to uh, municipalities. So they, you know, typically, uh, if there are uh, large operations that we come to know of them uh, from neighbor from neighbors who are experiencing some difficulty. So the thought was. That you know, that we're not made aware because it's, 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 it's ostensibly none of our business that somebody needs to grow cannabis to address a medical issue that they may have. But uh, but but uh, Aaron Berlitz establishes that we do have the authority to enforce our zoning bylaw and our, and, and and to enforce the building code and fire code should uh, should the medical cannabis facility not be consistent with our regulations and policies. Uh, and you know they they did find some precedent. I mean it's a bit early days, but they did find some precedent to support that position. And there are a number of, uh, uh, of challenges uh, or a number of uh, uh, court uh, court proceedings that uh, have yet to be determined. So that that will obviously uh, um, provided some additional uh, uh, information about just what. Uh, uh, what our, our authority, uh, what our authority might be as it relates to the enforcement of, uh, of uh, any nonconformities. So, that, uh, Mr. Chair, is a summary of, of uh, what we were, were able to find with respect to those two issues, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Diana? Yes, through you to Rob. Um, I, I do agree with your position on the odor nuisance um, bylaw. I think it's premature. But if we did sometime in the future decide that we move forward with that, would that be retroactive to any sites that are operating in our municipality prior to us doing that bylaw or would they be exempt? Yes, yes. so uh, yes, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, it's my understanding that the, you know, certain, certainly the Planning Act and I believe the Municipal Act and many of the acts that give us the authority to pass bylaws, you know, prohibit us from making those bylaws retroactive, right? So they're they're intended to apply from the from and after the date that they're passed. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Through you, um, on the draft bylaw, and I recognize we're not passing it tonight. We're going to have a public meeting and things could change. But on the draft bylaw, page five, 349.3 number B, um, it says that the um, setback should be a minimum of 50 meters. I thought we said it would be 300. Yes, I'll through you, Mr. Chair. So there is an upset minimum for all cannabis uh, facilities and uh, crops of 50 meters. So you'll never get a building or a crop closer to a lot line than 50 meters. Where the 300 comes in is when there's a um, sensitive land use nearby. So what the bylaw says is if there's a sensitive land use, then we apply the 300 meter setback from the crop or from the building to a sensitive land use. So so there's it's a two stages. You'll never get closer than 50, and you may have to be as far away as 300, depending on the existence of a sensitive land use. Thank you. Diana? Yes, I had a question on that very item as well. So to make it very clear to anyone reading the bylaw, could we not put in um, 
that the 50 meter setback only applies to lands that do not abut onto sensitive land uses or something to that effect. And then it's very clear what it's meant, what, what it means. Well, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm all for ensuring that the language is clear and I, I can certainly, I can certainly look at that. And if we can add some clarity to it, uh, Mr. Chair, we'd be happy to do that. But that's certainly the that's certainly the intent, and I I think it's 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 um, yeah again as I said if if we if we think that um, uh, that there's some additional language that would help kind of reinforce that that's the intent, then yeah, we can we can consider doing that. I hope I think you should because there's two of us that that was drawn to our attention and we didn't understand it. I don't know if anybody else found that as well. Okay, well, we'll leave that with you, Rob, for to do before the public. Um, there are no other questions. I had one. So, with that legal opinion, I would take it then that we will enforce our bylaws in in a way that is consistent with that legal opinion, Rob. Absolutely, yes. Okay, good, Donna. Yes, I had a. Uh, another rate payer that was um, confused about the federal law relating to growing of cannabis. And I don't know if um, this could be put in our bylaw anywhere that the growing of cannabis um, is a right at, because the federal government has made that law on agriculture on rural lands and um, they can do it as long as they have a federal license and they follow our bylaws. So I don't know if that could be put in somewhere that it's a, it's an actual right that we can't stop it as long as they have a license and they're following our bylaws. Can we do that anymore? Well, 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 I think I think that's yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to I'm trying to figure out how how that might find its way into the zoning bylaw. I know. Yeah, it's not, it's not something, you know, that typically we get into kind of a, um, a preamble or, or like a narrative of that nature. Um, you know, we simply, uh, you know, uh, recognize that it is an industry, it's a, it's a, it's a it's bona fide uh, commodity and, and, and it's regulated by the federal government and we need to find a way to uh, to find, strike, a, strike a balance, right, between the needs of the industry and the needs of the surrounding uh, public, right? So, yeah, I just don't know how to how to introduce that, um, other than if we were to provide, you know, per, you know, put together a bit of a guide, and maybe this might help with uh, with the question you had earlier as well, uh, Donna, about just clarifying what what the bylaw means, you know, in in the you know in you know, when the rubber hits the road, right? So, you know, we provided uh, a sketch of a typical farm parcel uh, and with with sensitive land uses in the surrounding area. And, uh, you know, it, the, that particular site plan kind of showed how the crop would have, would be impacted by the presence of those uh, sensitive land uses. And that would, that could find its way in a guide, right? And that guide could say, you know, uh, you know, it could be about this the regulation of cannabis in Selwyn Township, and uh, and it would you know would show anybody who's interested in that particular industry uh, exactly what it is uh, their their uh, obligations are and what their rights are, and we could talk about the issues like you that, that you brought up, which is you know how how did, how did we come to um, to this regulation? Well, you know this became an issue when the federal government. Uh, legalized or decriminalized uh, 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 cannabis. And so we had to react, right? And we could, I guess we could tell a bit of a story in a guide, right? Okay, well, if that's possible, that would be great because um, this person was ready to fight me and challenge me on this. So um, it could come up again. Yeah, and, and, and I did note in my report, in, in my summary of the, the legal opinion, right? That, that um, our lawyer did say that we, we can't regulate it out of existence, right? That's just not something that, that we have the authority to do, right? And so that kind of furthers your argument, uh, 
Don? Yeah, perhaps one of the things that we can do, Rob, is uh, we have our bylaws are all listed online, uh, is to put a hyperlink to uh, some FAQs on this particular bylaw. And so if you go to the bylaw, go to the subset under it is FAQs, and somebody can get that additional information that Don is looking for by just linking to it. That, that might be a way to do it. Thank you. Yep, we can, we can do that. Okay, anything else on that? We've got a, we'll have a public meeting, and so the public will have an opportunity to provide their input as to the particulars that are in the bylaw. So any other questions? Not seeing any, I think we need just a motion to recede from Anita. Second by Donna. All those in favor? That is carried. We move on to our consent agenda. Is Does anybody want, and so dealing with everything except 636, does anybody want to pull anything? Anita? Anita, what would you like to pull? Sorry. Uh, uh, so under correspondence 6A, uh, item 7, the Tourism Economic Recovery Task Force. 6, 6A7. Okay. Donna, you had your hand up. What would you like? Um, the 5A, the site plan updates. I have a couple questions. Okay. 5A. So we have 6A7 and 5A. Anything else? Okay, let's dispose of those first and all the other ones except 636. So it's in numerical order 5A. So Donna, ask your questions. Okay, this is actually um, the 5G part under 5A. I think I've got this right. I've just made notes and it's about parking, uh, rural development parking and it says the report indicates alternative sur surface solutions can be used instead of pavement. And I was just wondering um, what examples that would be other than gravel. If Rob could tell me some other examples of alternate materials for surfaces. Yeah, so I guess to your point, the typical alternative is, is gravel in a, in a rural context, but um, you know, to, people can use a, a low impact development product, so something that is more per, permeable. Right? They have uh, so a number of products being developed that allow for uh, marking, but also allow for water to permeate through them so that um, you know, diminishes the need for stormwater management, things of that nature. So that those, and there's a variety of those out there, right? Um, it comes in different forms, but uh, typically it's got, uh, you know, it's a product that you, you, you lay on the ground and it's got voids in it that you fill with gravel. One more question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, and um, I just wanted to say there was really a lot of work put into this and it's very comprehensive um, and it's helpful to us, but was it also designed to help people who are wanting to develop a site plan? Because it's pretty complex for the average person. So first of all, is this intended to be given to members of the public? That would be my first question. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's a guide that we've had available on our website for, for, for some time. Of course, this is an update to it and it has been improved, I think to your point. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's intended to provide Anybody who's looking to, to develop a property in Selwyn, that, that meets the definition of development, right? Uh, and is subject to site plan control. So things other than residential, most residential development. Uh, they need to be aware that you know, they're, going to, they're going to be tasked with providing a site plan that includes quite a bit of detail, right? And so typically that detail is provided by somebody whose job it is to, to develop sites. Uh, there's typically a civil engineer involved. And uh, so they understand you know, these are typical criteria. There's really nothing in the guide that you wouldn't find in most municipalities. Um, so it's not unfamiliar to people who are in the business, but to a, a lay person who, who, who's a business owner and just, you know, wants to, wants to build a building and, and invite people to come and 
to their retail operation or come and grab a meal or whatever the case may be. Yeah, it's yeah, it would be it would be something that they could, you know, could read and, and, and understand the vast majority of it. And it might generate some questions as well. And that's where we come in to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Anita, on your item, uh, correspondence uh, 6A7. So this is uh, it's a, a large document, a 30 page document. It's from the uh, Tourism Economic Recovery Task Force. And they have a list of top 10 recommendations of the task force. And um, there's some really, really good ideas. Um, the one that I especially liked was item number nine, that's on page seven. It says uh, create bite-sized mobile and scalable experiences during the transition period to a full reopening. I know we were talking earlier about with Megan, um, with some of the ideas that she has uh, after having spoken to, to businesses and how we can help them. But um, with, the, um, with the videos and everything that were made last year, I think it would be kind of neat if, uh, if staff could sort of look into some of these ideas that this um, tourism economic recovery task force, some of the ideas that they have put forward in that document, there might be some things that we can do locally uh, to promote um, our region, our township and all the great things that happen here. So it's just it's just an idea that maybe if staff were to take a close look at it and see if there's anything that sort of tweaks their interest. Okay, um, I'm sure staff will take a note of that. Yeah, we, we can certainly do that. Leisha and Megan can work on that. Thank you. So, uh, nothing else being pulled. I'll entertain a motion with the exception of 632 to receive those items. Anita, seconded by Donna, and all those in favor, carried. I'll turn the chair over to. Can I just add one point, um, Sherry? Or um, Andy, um, the link to number eight, the Ontario Land Tribunal well, Tribunal new processes, it actually linked back to the, and I'm talking about what's on the web page. Um, it linked back to item seven. So the new processes Ontario Land Tribunal link did not work. I was just curious to see, it doesn't matter, but what I'm saying is that uh, I would yeah. have been curious to see what that document was about. Anyway, perhaps we can add it to the correspondence of our next meeting because the link did not work quite right. No. Okay. I will turn the chair over. All right. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch what uh, item you were occurring the conflict on. 632. 632. All right. Um, so. We need a mover and seconder to receive this. Anita, Jerry, all in favor? It's Carrie, thank you. Turn the chair back to you. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to, um, I'm not sure Madam Clerk can help me. Are the petitions part of the consent agenda? Uh, sorry, no, they aren't. Okay, so we have a petition on the Lakeville campground. I'm going to assume that that will be passed on to our consultant uh, for uh, along with the other public input that's being received. Is that correct, Andy? Uh, they're aware of it. It won't actually be part of the final report. It's being received. We'll just receive it this evening okay, for the so public record. A motion to receive, Anita, seconded by uh, Donna. All those in favor? Carry. Okay. We will go to our portfolio updates and start with Donna on the community services. Well, you've already done the transportation part of it, so and housing. Yes, um, I I don't know if we wanted to um, say anything about the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. They had a recommendation for endorsement. Donna, I'm just going to interrupt you when we when we do the. When we accept all of the consent items, what we're doing is accepting those reports. If you want to, if you want to discuss them, you need to pull them the same way that we pull correspondence. Okay, so let's we'll have to go back no, and and um, pull it. It's okay. I I was mixed up there. I've done that before too. Okay, 
Okay, and it, and and I do it. I do it too, right? Because you get it, it's not hard to confuse me, and uh, that's done on a regular basis. So, anyways, so are you okay? Because we can we can go back if you will. I'm okay. You're uh, okay. So I think we have covered everything on the transportation. The library, um, just a reminder that if anybody had an interest in donating an item for our online silent auction for the fall, um, they would like your donations uh, submitted to your local library by the 1st of August. And um, we've already discussed the rack and they had another committee meeting and they they put forth another submission to Monteith Brown and police services board we haven't had another meeting yet it's scheduled for the end of July. Thanks Donna. That's it. Economic development Sherry. Thank you for you. Peterborough Power Sports recently opened on Lakefield Road just north of the giant tiger. Two local lads own it. They sell high quality performance parts and a good selection of used parts. They serve the small engine power sport machines and they sell dirt bikes, ATVs and electric scooters. JBS Surveyors is a new business located on Lakefield Road. The Chocolate Rabbit will have a new owner August the 1st. Elaine and Scott Webster um, are the new owner. Scott is also a chef at Viamede. An offer to purchase had been made by a Toronto firm and Lois did not want to sell to them because they were intending to make the chocolate in the GTA and then bring it out and she wanted it produced locally. So uh, this will continue with these new owners. And finally, we heard about filming in our township locally and I think this is good for our economic development. And I hope that Leisha is in contact with some of these players to see that we get a little bit more of this filming in our township. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, next, we have uh, Public Works. Jerry, from Parks and Rec. Thank you. Um, Public Works are just cruising along, getting stuff ready for the tar and chip season like they always do. And, and so sort of that work continues with ditching and, and all that. The uh, Park and Rec, um, the barn demolition over in Ennismore, that started yesterday with a completion date on or before the 23rd of July. Uh, the gazebo got moved back to the uh, end of the causeway yesterday. Um, and there's a work party for Bell Rotary um, this week. And not, that doesn't mean a party. It means that they're going to be working. Um, and with stage uh, or step three starting Friday, almost all the kids groups are running uh, practices for softball and baseball. Um, ultimate uh, Frisbee may start in September and the adult leagues will get going. Um, and we will open our facilities right now if um, during step three, if demand um, requires it. Um, and to Sherry's, um, uh, portfolio, uh, Shimong or Dr. J's at Shimong Lodge, they are absolutely shooting the lights out there, um, with busyness. It is absolutely ridiculous there. I won't comment on the information I've received, but trust me, they are, um, they're pumping the food out. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Anita? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have a whole lot to um, to include in today. Is uh, so obviously the deep the deep paved project at uh, Winfield Shores has uh, has taken place. So I'm uh, hopefully get going to get a chance to go up there in the next few days just to see it. Um, and I'm assuming that with uh, stage three uh, opening, that hopefully that I'm sure that a lot of the seniors have missed their activities and are looking forward to maybe getting things back in gear. Great, thank you. Uh, on my portfolio, um, just to go over a couple of things. First of all, I had an opportunity to attend uh, the announcement uh, on Via Rail and the, it, uh, the, the, uh, the money that they're putting into it this year uh, and for the beginning of their procurement process. Uh, and then Sherry and I had an opportunity uh, with uh, with Dave Smith and uh, Minister Smith, Todd Smith, 
uh, to uh, do the announcement on the, uh, the money for the natural gas. Uh, we also, and we talked about this, was the money that we received uh, under our transportation grant, the additional money and the extension. If colleagues are okay, uh, I'd like us to send a, a note to Minister Mulroney. We had made a, 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 a specific delegation to her at AMO uh, and uh, to do this what was done. And so if colleagues are okay, we'll just pen a quick thank you note to her. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, on public health, as was mentioned, we're in, we're in step three. Uh, the goals for step four uh, we, we are 80% a single dose, 75% um, for second dose that's across the province and no individual public health unit can be less than 70. So that's, that's the target. So to that point in Ontario right now uh, for 12 and over, those, so those are people who are eligible we're at 79% for one dose and 55% people now have uh, second doses. In our community, uh, that's, we have uh, 55,821 people have received both doses. That's 51% and our first dose is at 78%. So we're, uh, we're very much in line with the, uh, very much in line with the province. And uh, we continue uh, to have uh, vaccinations to uh, a number of, uh, of different uh, different venues, including at uh, at drugstores. Uh, so that's uh, a bit on the public health side, and uh, that would be my report. Okay, we'll move on to item number eleven, uh, unfinished business, and so. We need to schedule an open house for the draft rooming house bylaw on August the 12th. Uh, and the suggestion is we do it from two to four and five to seven. Angie, did you want to speak to this at all? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I did send council an email outlining the format. So with the uh, fact that we're in step three, we do uh, anticipate that we can have an in-person open house. Uh, we will have to be mindful of limiting numbers. So I think we'll, uh, we'll just have people pre-register according to the numbers uh, and give them a block of time when they can come in and review information panels. We'll also make everything available online uh, for people to look at and, and provide comment on. And um, the, uh, the rooming house bylaws would be applicable to the Lakefield and Woodland Acres area. That's where there's water and sewer. Uh, so we'll focus the uh, promotion of the open house to those, uh, those areas. Okay, is everybody comfortable with the what was circulated? Okay, so can we make a motion then to establish that? Jerry, moving. And Jerry seconding, all those in favor? Jerry. Okay, uh, and just one other thing, colleagues. Um, what, and, and I, I think we'll ask Angie maybe if she can do this or Janice, is uh, what the rules would be if we were to go back into the council chambers or when we go back into the council chambers for in-person meetings. Because uh, even under step three, we, we still have uh, so, uh, physical distancing limits. And there, there may be others. I pulled it off for, I think, 64 pages of the, of the regs. Uh, so they're pretty extensive. So maybe uh, uh, either Angie or Janice, we can ask you to, 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 to take a look at uh, what it would mean and what the restrictions would be, et cetera, for returning to the council chambers. Would that be in order? Yes, we'll definitely uh, do that. And I think we'll continue as well to offer the hybrid option. So. Uh, we can certainly allow people to participate virtually if they wish to. Yes. Okay. So we'll hear from you on that. And then when I, let's do the bylaws first and then we'll move to go into closed session. So we had the site plan control bylaw. That's the one that Donna was talking about under section five. And then we need to uh, authorize the modernization grant, the digi digitalization project. Somebody like to move both of those, Anita, seconded by Donna, all those in favor, carried. 
I will now entertain a motion to go into closed. Uh, Anita, Jerry, all those in favor? Hey, colleagues, we're going to sign off of here. You've received an email with your dial-in uh, information for the closed session. It's 727, so if we could resume at uh, 732. So that's five minutes from now. You've received an email with the with the phone number. If you can't find it, uh, just uh, contact Angie and she'll resend it to you. Okay, colleagues, we'll see you on the other side.